Well, tonight we will, uh, we are resuming our study of new justice. This is our third session. And um, it's always, I think, great to go back and, and look at uh, what is our our anchor verse, our key verse, our main main verse for this study from the Old Testament prophet Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord Yahweh require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. I would encourage you guys to go back and actually read all of Micah 6. It's kind of an interesting chapter as God is speaking to both the people in Judah, but Micah was also foretelling the, the downfall of the northern kingdom of Israel and how the people had strayed um, from faithfulness to God, genuine faithfulness to God, and not just religiosity. So uh, it's, this, is a, this is a great verse in the middle of that context that really highlights that. But I thought it might be good um, in order to review what we talked about last week. And I think that you know, we missed Joy last week. And yeah. so um, it would be good to help her have, have a little bit of a sense of what we talked about. So here's those four points again. God alone is God. We are made in his image in light of God's love and God's ideal for community. But because we're talking about being God's people, and we're not simply just talking as a bunch of people who live in Buckeye neighbors, or we're not just, you're not auditing a, a, a class on religious matters, you know, comparative religions. This is, that's not what this is. We are talking tonight as God's people as as the church we're thinking about these issues as followers of jesus so one of the questions that comes to mind is this how does how does do justice fit with our one mission as followers of jesus christ how do we take this idea from micah in the old testament do justice and then how do we how do we fit it in how do we make sense of it in light of of being a, a new covenant people being the church of Jesus and this one mission that God has given us. So, so it might be that we can ask this question here. Is, is, is our work as God's people about sharing the gospel or doing justice? Now, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in just a second, but bear with me for a minute as we kind of think through this idea. Sharing the gospel or doing justice? What should we be about? as the people of God. Now, on one hand, when we talk about sharing the gospel, we're talking about something that is absolutely central to the identity of the church. And when we talk about it, that's not hard to find in, in the New Testament because it's repeated over and over and over again. Um, there's The word gospel is used over 90 times in the New Testament. Most of those are used in the epistles, especially by Paul. And I'll give you some passages just to talk about the centrality of the gospel. For example, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1.16. Now, we met, I mentioned that on Sunday because by the time that we got to the passage that we looked at on Sunday, Romans 8, that was kind of the climax of all of this talk about the gospel, this theme of the gospel that Paul was unpacking for us. So the first eight chapters of Romans is all about the gospel. And I would argue the rest of Romans is about the gospel as well. But um, it clearly is a dominant theme for Paul. And rightly so, because it is the power of God for salvation. Notice the verse, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There's equity, right? There's the equity that we talked about. Look at this verse. Paul says at the end of Romans, here's to make that point about the whole book being gospel-centered. I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, Paul says. It's his ambition 
to make known the good news of Jesus Christ. And then along those lines, he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 23, I do it all for the sake of the gospel. That theme keeps coming up how gospel focused Paul is and how crucial that was to what he, how he saw himself and his work in the world. He also goes on to Philippians and talks about, to the Philippians, he talks about because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, it's a major way he understood his relationship with that church and every church is that there was a partnership that they participated in together. He and those who were praying for him and supporting him. And that relationship was defined by the work of the gospel. What has happened to me, says Paul, the suffering that he was dealing with because he was imprisoned. He said it's really served to advance the gospel. Don't you love that gospel colored lens that, that Paul is seeing his whole life through? Uh, he says, well, what does this mean? What is What are the implications of this? How should I understand this? Well, let me think about in light of the gospel. Well, wow, it's giving me more opportunity to preach the gospel. It's even It's even provoked others to preach the gospel even when their motivations were kind of crummy. <laughs> That's what he goes on to talk about. He also says to them, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So, so this is not just a cause in terms of a great work to be done. It's a work that takes place, yes, on a mission field, but also, on, also within each of us, that the gospel is bearing fruit in us that our lives are to be lived in light of the gospel and in a way that really is commensurate with the gospel, how glorious the gospel is, how valuable it is. Well, we should strive to live lives of such value uh, in light of this incredible calling that we have from God. A couple more verses. Paul says in Colossians 1, the gospel which has come to you as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing. Now, of course, Paul has in mind generally the Roman world, right? The, the Greek Roman world, when he says the whole world, since this is writing in the first century. But even then he was seeing so many different people from so many different places, speaking so many different languages, coming to hear the gospel, coming to know about the gospel. And it was this worldwide focus that this worldwide mission that just consumed him in terms of the mission of God. And this, this was nothing new. This was in keeping with Jesus, with what Jesus had already said in Matthew 24, that this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Now, we might think about the work of the church in light of a passage like Matthew 24. 28, where it says, go and make disciples of all nations. Is that different from this gospel focus that Paul has? No. How do they fit together? Well, in order to make disciples, you need the gospel. In order to here, Laurel? No. In order to make disciples... You need to preach the gospel. Does that, does that, do you guys agree with that? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. You, you can't, you can't be a true disciple of Jesus w without the gospel. Absolutely. So we, yeah, we never want to see those things separated from one another. Um, it is true that the, that we, to go make disciples, we need to proclaim the message about Jesus. It's only through the forgiveness of the cross that we can follow Christ, you know, that we can live for him as his disciples. But we need that new birth. We need that, that forgiveness and reconciliation to God being justified. And so um, it's, 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 there's no real argument against the idea that the, the Paul and, and the other apostles in the early church saw it as their mission to proclaim the gospel and bring the gospel into all the earth as Paul just so in fact makes 
just emphasizes over and over again. But um, we ask the question, okay, so does that mean we should share the gospel? That should be our emphasis instead of doing justice? Well, let me, let me put it to you this way. Rather than either or, God's people best do justice by both sharing the truth of the gospel and living in step with the truth of the gospel. And that's a phrase from Galatians chapter 2, verse 14. So this is not an either or like I had at the top of the page here before, right? Sharing the gospel or doing justice. Well, that's a that's an unnecessary uh, division we're creating, isn't it? So we do justice by sharing the truth of the gospel and living in step with the truth of the gospel, which will, that's what, that's exactly what we want to unpack tonight. We really want to understand if we are to be a gospel centered people, what is that? How does that tie into this idea of do justice? How does it shape the way that we think about justice? Um, Okay. Let's, let's do that. Let's keep going forward here and talk about this I, these two parts of sharing the truth of the gospel and living in step with the truth of the gospel. Sharing the gospel or doing justice. Well, we talked about it both. And, and why, is that so, why is it so critical? How is the gospel so central to the idea of doing justice? Why do we need to understand the gospel and be a gospel people if we are to do justice? Well, number one, the gospel reveals the real roots of injustice. The gospel reveals the real roots of injustice. What do we know are the real roots of injustice? Sin. Sin. Yeah, that's a good simple, simple answer, right? Sin is are the, the human sin, and we define that, of course, as like I, like I always do, uh, living a me-centered life in a God-centered universe, right? That is the root of all human injustice. Let me give you some verses. This was the passage that you looked at as part of your homework. This is verses one through three. Could, could one of you out there read that? One of you on the line? Go ahead, go ahead, Mom. Okay. When you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So what does that tell us about the roots of injustice? Yeah. So because, because human beings are spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins, it manifests itself in individual injustice, societal injustice, any of the injustices we can think about through history and even in the present age are motivated by the, by the depraved human heart that is alienated from God and hostile towards God, that is bent on, is bent on its own desires, right? It, it lives according to its own passions. And God being a just God, what does that verse tell us about his just response? We are by nature children of wrath. wrath. Yeah, we're children of God's wrath. That is, we're born into the world as sinners, only deserving the judgment of God for this kind of spiritual rebellion and hostility, me-centeredness, playing God ourselves. So here's, here's you know, that we are able to understand this. Um, we see in Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, verse 3, 
we get a little bit more of a description of the the, the fallen human heart, the 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 unredeemed human heart depraved in bondage under sin. It says, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient. We were led astray. We were slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. That sounds like a lot of a lot of the injustice that we see in our world, doesn't it? People driven by greed, mm -hmm. trying to feed their own passions and pleasures, uh, hatred, motivating others, malice towards others, envy towards others, and thus unfair treatment or accusation, false accusations, all sorts of things, you know, that flow out of these that we see in these maybe personal injustices, the way we treat one another, or these larger scale injustices that we see around us, both in our community, in our nation, around the world. It is driven, we know from God's word, it is driven by this kind of heart. And so the gospel addresses this very issue, doesn't it? The gospel is all about God's answer for this root of injustice, this, the, the, the human, the depraved, fallen human condition. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yes. So that really does help us because, it does, now does that mean, does that mean apart from the gospel that, 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 that human beings can't really deal with injustice? No. No. Laurel says no. Explain. <laughs> <laughs> Explain. Well, I mean, like <laughs> the whole world isn't, it's still here. Like we're still intact. There are still police officers that aren't Christian. There are still people that do community service and help to do justice every day in our community that aren't Christians. It's by God's grace that that happens, yes, but just because you're not a Christian doesn't mean that you can't do justice. Okay, what do you guys think about that? Just because you're not Christian doesn't mean you can't do justice. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah, okay. true. I think the idea of maybe justice can be like attractive for a lot of people or doing good things for, you know, maybe different reasons, but, you know, maybe there's like a satisfaction and pleasure or, you know, just, uh, you know, being able to get someone out of a situation or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and people may, people may have an honest heart to help others and yet not know Jesus Christ. Right. Okay. Yeah. And what about what about this first point of the gospel reveals the real roots of injustice? What might be how do people without the gospel think about the roots of injustice? A lot of them think man is basically good. Okay, so maybe the roots of injustice are what? Yeah. Like politics or you know maybe poverty or something. Politics, poverty. I mean, I think somebody else. I mean, that they think it's somebody else. Somebody else is to blame. Right, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. never them. It's never them. Right. And what many, about... and many, many people sometimes that maybe you guys have heard this, they'll say, well, I'm going to heaven. I'm a good person. Right, right. 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 Well, I think people think that they're basically good people, but they know they aren't perfect. They know they mess up, but they're on their scale of messing up. That doesn't make them a bad person. Like they're not, they don't, they're not a murderer. They don't murder. Right. That's, that's right. Their, and their standard. Like a, like a bellman that I talked to, you know, probably 20, 25 years ago, another bellman that I worked with at the Ritz Carlton, as I was preaching the gospel to him, he said, well, what are you trying to get me to say? He said, I'm not Adolf Hitler. 
<laughs> it's because they don't, they never define their messing up as sin. Right. 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 Well, it's easy to say I messed up. I messed up doesn't mean anything. I, you know, I don't have to feel guilty about messing up. Everybody messes up. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. But when we talk about the, the roots of injustice, one of the, for here's an example of something. Uh, people might say, well, there's, there's injustice in our society because uh, certain people are not given access to an equitable education. Now, it, is that true that certain people don't have access to uh, the kind of education that they that they need? Yes. yes. Yes, absolutely. But would we as would we as Christians say that that's the real bottom root of injustice, lack of education? No. 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 Right. No, it would be it, it would be the heart the of the whatever who who denies who who would deny the value of others that they should have a proper education. I think like even like maybe like a bitterness, you know, like someone who, you know, maybe grew up in a bad family and, you know, they're not in the place where they'd imagine that they'd want to be. They kind of hold on to this grudge maybe, you know, because, of, you know, it's like an economic thing or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know, like people and then, you know, they think that their problems are, they, you know, yeah. My dad was an alcoholic or, you know, or I had to live with my grandma and, you know, uh, or. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think it's just, it, it's, it's, if we just think of it in simple terms, it, it's that without taking away from the reality of inequity in regard to education, we can also say that that is not the ultimate root cause that the root cause is still the depraved human heart separated from in rebellion against God. Because as we know, although education can do a wonderful thing for a young man or a young woman in giving them opportunity and preparing them for the world. And that that is a good cause, a very good cause to advocate for. We also know there are highly educated people who are wicked. Right. Mm. Education is not the saving grace that will somehow uh, that will somehow wipe injustice from the earth if everybody is properly educated. That doesn't mean it's not a good cause to advocate for. It's just not the ultimate root of injustice. But the gospel helps us to understand that. So it gives us perspective in knowing that. Uh, this is a good cause, but we have to keep it in mind in terms of what, what is the ultimate cause of injustice in any area. We know that as Christians because God has revealed that to us. So let me give you another one here. Sharing the gospel and doing justice. The gospel perfectly exemplifies the connection between justice and mercy. The gospel perfectly exemplifies the connection between justice and mercy. We have we, we've 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 kind of set up an interesting uh, tension, somewhat of a tension, in our last two studies together. We've talked about the idea that justice is giving to each person what they are due, what they deserve. We talked about that uh, in terms of a definition of justice, and then each person kind of unpacked that idea last week. Anyone and everyone, all made in the image of God. But we have a little bit of attention because we know that as sinners, we deserve what? Death. Yeah. Right. The judgment of God, the wrath of God. Wrath of God, yeah. So. But we also, as human beings made in the image of God, we are we are deserving of what? Love. Love. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Okay. Justice. Well, th this idea, we 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 definitely saw that there was this idea that God has a incredibly deep heart for the needy, right? Yeah. Right. Where there was inequity that God wanted to see that equity restored both judicially and socially, economically. So if we think about ourselves as needy sinners, 
there's a there's a place of desperation that we exist in that God's heart for the needy must be responding to. I it's it's uh, it's unimaginable to think that God wouldn't be responding to our condition as those who are in such desperate need as sinners our poverty our spiritual poverty and yet at the same time he has a holy wrath burning against us as sinners yeah. <laughs> right interesting. Yeah. It's interesting it's an interesting tension that exists yeah. Feel like, or you know how how to experience that. Yeah. For us. So when Jesus to the people, and he has compassion. He says, "I feel like sheep without a shepherd, being harassed." Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We hear we hear about the heart of God in Jesus when He looks on the people, but Jesus also spoke about the judgment to come, and how um, you know how the people yeah. had been unwilling to listen to Him. Right. Oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem. You know, if you had known the only known the day of your visitation, right? You would have res, you should have responded to to me in coming. And yet, you know, there's judgment coming. Not one stone will be left on another. So, there's the, both of these ideas are present all throughout the Bible of justice and mercy. The gospel is a perfect example of those. Let me give you a, let me give you let me give you a, a biblical defense of that or example of what I'm talking about. We've looked at this passage before. I think it might have been on the first week, but I just want to read through it one more time, and I want you to see the the, the what's being said here in terms of through the lens of justice. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There we are, as sinners and the needy, right? We've all sinned and all fall short of the glory of God, irrespective of who we are as persons. All those made in the image of God have fallen short as sinners. But it says, and all have, all are justified by his grace as a gift. Now, does that mean all people who have ever been born or whoever will be born are going to be justified by his grace? No. Uh all people who believe in him right. right everybody's not going to believe and therefore be justified by god's grace so we are justified now that word justified is that a is that a justice term yeah it, it is yeah because it's a legal term isn't it yeah you made right with them it, it means to be acquitted right all uh, acquitted of all charges um so that justified is a legal term. It's a it's a jurisprudence term. It's a justice term. It's to, it means to be acquitted of all charges, and that that comes as a as a, as by His grace as a gift. There's the mercy of God. So how does the mercy of God bring about a justice um, a justice decision an acquittal? Well, it says right here, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, through the payment that was made in Christ Jesus. How did Christ Jesus make a payment? He's the one that God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. He was put forward as, as a sacrifice of satisfaction in light of the wrath of God. His blood made atonement and that atonement was accepted, and it's to be received by faith uh, by any who comes to him. So God did this to show his righteousness. Now remember, righteousness in the Old Testament was always connect, was so often connected with justice. The foundations of God's throne are righteousness and justice. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. And it goes on, it goes on in many, many, many other passages to connect righteousness and justice. Mm -hmm, right. And even, even the Greek words are connected to one another. This word, dikaiosune, uh, for righteousness is related to the word that we're going to hear in just a minute, dikaios, for just, justice. So they really are connected to one another.
So this was to show, Romans chapter 3, verse 25, this was to show God's righteousness, that God is, is a God of justice and righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, God had passed over former sins. Well, how does he get away with that? If he's righteous and just, he's got to address those sins. Mm -hmm. It was to show his righteousness slash justice at the present time so that he might be just and at the same time the justifier of the one who has faith in jesus so because god's justice the demands of justice were met in jesus christ god is able to give his grace as a gift and justify the sinner through faith in christ this of course the main point i'm trying to make here is that god's just demands in terms of his wrath was satisfied while at the same time god's mercy in light of the needy was on display in such beauty right that he he not only was just in judging sin but he was also merciful and gracious in justifying the sinner it's a wonderfully complex idea. It's very, there's a tension there, but, and I say all that, I say all that just to point out that we as Christians, when we think about justice, always need to make sure we're defining justice according to what God's word has revealed in terms of justice and mercy. There are people today who come down hard on certain issues they come down much harder on the rule of law side of things. And there are others on certain issues who come down much harder on the mercy, mercy. compassion side of things. And often these two find themselves at odds when in fact Christians should find the way to be able to reconcile both of these things, upholding the rule of law if it's a just law while at the same time trying to show compassion for the lawbreaker to show mercy to the lawbreaker does that make sense you guys yes yes there's something very difficult in certain cases about that it's not it's not as cut and dry as i think some people want to make it today but we gravitate to extremes. We gravitate towards simplistic kinds of calls to action and simplistic explanations for things. It's these, these, these issues, including the gospel issues, are far more complicated than that. And they require our very best thinking and the very best of our heart. Let me give you one more here. This is really the key right here. Sharing the gospel and doing justice. The gospel alone empowers a life of gracious and rich justice. The gospel alone empowers a life of gracious and rich justice. And gracious, I would take gracious to mean what I just talked about in terms of grace-based, mercy, mercy, compassion, that kind of informed justice that's informed by mishpat, mishpat of the Old Testament, the mercy and the compassion. And we'll talk about rich in just a second, that word rich justice. Here's what I mean though. Let me unpack this third point a little bit. The gospel alone empowers a life of gracious and rich justice. Why? Because it gives us a new heart. It gives us a new heart. The very thing that drives human injustice is the thing that the gospel comes to transform the human heart and that gospel what christ has done brings us this new heart and what we see for example so we see what does this new heart look like well here's a here's a good passage second corinthians 5 17 talking about the new heart if anyone is in christ he is a new creation the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, there are many verses kind of like this, but this is a well-known verse, an excellent verse in summarizing the fact 
that we really do change when we become followers of Christ, right? When we're born again, we really do become a new creature or a new creation. But then we need to think about what does that mean in terms of justice? Somebody read this verse for me, Titus 2, 13 and 14. Laurel's going to read it nice and loud. Here she goes. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Okay, now, is that a gospel verse? Yeah. Because he gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness, yeah. 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 Look at that. Look at how gospel focused that verse is. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us. There it is. But look what it goes on to say. He redeems us from all lawlessness. And he purifies for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So it's this idea of good works is wrapped up. It's just it's it's. It's it's a it's a such a natural part of the outflow of the gospel as we see here, because God not only saved us through Jesus from sin, he also saved us through Jesus for himself and his purposes. He saved us from a sinful agenda, our sinful agenda as sinners, and he saves us for his glorious agenda as saints. Bearing fruit in us, but just like it being imperfect, though, you know, like the health for good works. I mean, ideally, you know, yes, the gospel would influence our thinking to a point where, you know, it's uh, more, I don't know, like blunt that we uh, do the good works, like, I don't know, getting caught up on certain things or not having a clear understanding. We, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and Stephen's point is a great one that that we are we are a people who have been redeemed, um, zealous for good works, um, but we do that we do those imperfectly, and we struggle. We can we can most certainly can and do struggle with good works. That's not new because just a few verses later in Titus chapter three, verse eight. Paul has to emphasize this fact. He says, Titus, look, the saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. So there's Paul having to insist and and stress and emphasize the fact that the Christians and these new believers should be engaged in good works. And that's not the end of it. He even goes to the very end of the book, only a few verses later in chapter three, that was verse chapter three, verse eight. This is Titus chapter three, verse 14. And again, he says it again, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. What's required there? That God's people learn. They have to be taught. They have to learn what it means to be devoted to good works. Have we as a church, have we as the church done well at this? That's a good question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue of knowledge, and knowledge, self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and in increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's yeah. Absolutely. There's that, there's that idea of a progression in faith, a growth in faith. 
and that as we grow in that faith, we become more effective and fruitful. But that process works hand in hand with the, as Peter says before that, actually after that, right, I'm writing these things to you to stir you up by way of reminder. So he's got to remind them. He's provoking them with a holy provocation. He's trying to exhort them and push them. And exactly why we're doing a class like this on due justice, we're trying to spur one another on to love and to good works. Hebrews chapter 10. That's what we want to do. We want to spur one another on to more and more of this very thing. Let me give you a couple other verse, another verse. This was the end of the verse we had for homework. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 where we heard about the justice of God, that we deserve the wrath of God as, as those who are uh, children of wrath, those who are dead in our trespasses and sins. And yet in that passage, as you saw it this week, we also heard about the mercy or the grace of God in making us alive, for we are saved by grace, right? Not by works. It's by grace through faith, not by works so that no one should boast. And then we get this verse. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. No one's saved by good works, but we are certainly saved for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Can we take credit for the good works? No, we can't take credit for any of our salvation, including the outflow of the fruit of our salvation, because God's already prepared those good works that we are to walk in. We, he is calling us to be faithful, to step out and trust him that he has these good works that we can walk in them because he's making us like Jesus, who, of course, is the very best standard for good works <laughs> that we have looking at his life. Here's another verse. Have, having, put on, having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. There's the new heart. It's a new self. It is being renewed, a process of renewal uh, to become more and more like Jesus. Here's a beautiful connection to this idea of the image of God in all people. Is the image of God in all people something that we uh, drives us to give each person their due? Absolutely. But is the image of God in all people reflected perfectly? No, it's tainted, right? right? Image is marred in all sinners. It's clouded. It's distorted. That is never gives us justification to ignore the image of God in any human being in terms of justice. But it does point us to the fact that that image of God in us is only going to be brought to growing wholeness through Christ. And that's what God is doing in us, this new heart. Now, a new heart, the gospel alone empowers a life of gracious and rich justice. How? Well, a new heart, but it also gives us a new motivation. Let's go from Colossians chapter 3, the verse I just showed you about being putting on the new self, to Colossians 4.1. Somebody read that. Maybe Margie or Philip, would you unmute and read that for us? Colossians 4 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, oh, treat your bond bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Okay. Th <laughs> sorry. sorry for that confusion, guys. Thank you, Philip, for doing that. Um, mass. What do we see here? We do we see justice? Is this a is this a discussion about justice here? Yeah. Absolutely. Right? There's there's to be equity in terms of how a master and, and one of these household servants, we might today say a, a, an employer and an employee, there's print same prints and print same similar principles here. There's to be equity in that relationship. Right? There's to be equity in that relationship. And that equity, Paul appeal, what does Paul appeal to? What truth does Paul appeal to in order to drive home that point about equity? The master in heaven. That's right. 
The master has a new motivation. This Christian employer or Christian master of the household has a new motivation because they are looking to God for their direction and their guidance and to glor glorify him. They understand they are under him and they do, they want to do as he pleases, as he wills. And so they want to honor, glor they want to glorify God by, by doing what God has called them to do and being just, being equitable, being fair, uh, being reasonable in their, in these relationships. So, um, in terms of identity, look at this too. Another idea, oh, sorry, idea, the idea of motivation. How does the gospel motivate us? Well, the gospel uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, notice how gospel rich this is. For the love of Christ controls us. And this, and Christ, I had to cut out a little bit just to fit it here. Christ, the love of Christ controls us. It talks about how he died and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Amen. Mm -hmm. So there's a motivation that as Christ has loved us, we therefore go with that same love. It controls us. It compels us. It motivates us to, to give that Christ-like love and demonstrate that Christ-like love to others especially if it's gospel centered and gospel shaped we think of those who are in desperate need as sinners as those who are uh, just as christ gave to us as needy sinners we look around and see the spiritually needy the physically needy the economically needy and our love should be stirred because it's the love of christ it's the love of christ that's controlling us and compelling us uh here's another one this is another beautiful gospel shaped and gospel centered um reminder in terms of motivation and justice equity second corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 for you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich yet for your sake he became poor so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Now, that's in the context, that, that verse is in the context of what? Paul talking about, anybody know the context? He's talking to the Corinthians about their giving to this work of collecting money for the poor in Jerusalem, this offering that Paul was collecting. And he talks about how the Macedonian Christians have been so exemplary because they gave according to their means and even beyond their means to participate, to have the, they, they thought of it as a privilege of participating with Paul and the others in this work of blessing the Jewish saints in Jerusalem. The Jewish Christians and Paul is trying to stir the Corinthians to be to be committed to what they've already committed themselves to by word saying that they wanted to participate as well and Paul says look I don't he's not what he wants to do is motivate them with the gospel and say don't you know that Jesus himself gave sacrificially so that you might become spiritually rich through his poverty and and that's the same kind of motivation that we should look to the gospel and say how does how is the gospel motivating me to that same kind of sacrificial love amen yes amen okay let's look at let's look at the third point here in terms of the gospel the gospel empowers us for a life of gracious and rich justice because it also gives us a new anchor, a new anchor. Let me explain what I mean by that. Here's a verse that is well known, but usually a lot of times verse 13 is taken out of context, but here's the whole context, not the whole context, but enough of it. Philippians chapter four, 
verses 11 through 13, Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Paul says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, what is Paul, what is Paul's anchor there in terms of dealing with these kinds of disparities? Christ. The power of Christ in him. Yeah. What if he didn't have Christ who was strengthening him? What might he be tempted to do in these situations? Boast. Well, look at the situations. He, he gives two, two, he gives kind of a, what's called like a dialectic. He gives uh, the idea of, of being in, uh, being hungry and having plenty or having, being in abundance or being in need. What might be the temptations in either of those conditions to take it upon himself to satisfy the hunger and needs in um, unjust ways and sinful ways yes apart apart from Christ okay and what if he had an abundance if he had an abundance he would still praise the Lord well but if he, had, if he had an abundance, if he had an abundance and did not have Christ what might he be tempted to in terms of yeah. Well, like you, I said, both, both be prideful. Okay, both of you are being prideful. Like his situation's better than it actually is. Okay. I'm thinking of those who have an abundance and who, in greed and fear, try to protect. Try to get more. They, they try to protect what they have. Oh, right? gosh. Yeah. Build or, get more, or, or get more. <laughs> yeah. Or get more, yeah, so that they feel even more like secure uh, in quote in in quotes, right? Uh, even though it's not real security, people want to have. So, so for example, people in our society who want to stay in power or who want to stay wealthy, oftentimes can be tempted to try to manipulate. manipulate the system and 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 in very inequitable ways, unjust ways, uh, position themselves so that no one can have what they have or. No, it can't be taken from them. Uh, and oftentimes their hearts are closed to those in need because maybe they're fearful of not having enough for themselves or whatever might be the case. So what I'm saying is that all the injustice that we see around us and the injustice that we ourselves are guilty of often in many cases is driven by something like fear where we, we are fearful of someone who's different than us, or we are fearful of someone taking something that we have, or we are fearful of losing some privilege or rights. I mean, you could just go right down the list in, how, in terms of how fear inspires injustice. But what the gospel does is it gives us a new anchor so that we don't have to be afraid we don't have to be afraid of, of something that comes and, and to say, you know what, I know the right thing to do and, and I don't want to do it because I'm afraid I will lose out or I will have to give up or something bad's going to happen. I mean, you can just look at, you can just look at political ads today and how, how they try to use fear and fear mongering to get people to do certain things and vote a certain way. So fear is a very big a, big, a very big factor in terms of, of this kind of system that we operate in. Uh, and that's different than just informing people of things that they need to be concerned about. I'm speaking about real fear mongering. So for us, we don't have to give into any kind of fear based appeal because we trust that God is for us. Therefore, who can be against us? And then the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We trust that God can, and that, that God can, we, that he, we can do all things through him who strengthens us, whether we have a lot or a little, right? Whether we are uh, in the political majority or the political minority, whether we are whatever the case might be, we are not tempted to 
to a life of inequity, unfairness, un injustice, because of fear of loss or fear of whatever. We have an anchor that is God's faithfulness and love through the gospel, and that is secured by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Excuse me. <laughs> let, me, let me give you one more point here. This is the gospel gives us a new identity, a new identity. We talked about this last week, if you recall, with Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the glorious crowning of our identity. This is the this is the uh, acme. This is the pinnacle, the number one uh, uh, um, truth about who we are, that we are one in Christ Jesus, that we belong to God through Christ Jesus, that we are children of God. Uh, that is the that is the controlling idea in terms of that should be the controlling idea in how we think about ourselves, how we see ourselves. Does that wash all of these other things away? No, not at all. Still there, yeah. But it compels us not to use these things to create unjust divisions, not to use these things to treat one another badly, not to use these distinctions to, to think we're better than someone else, right? That's what was going on in the church, that there was inequity. There was an inequity uh, and injustice in the church because people were saying, well, I'm a Jew, you're just a, a, a Gentile, or I'm a man and you're a woman, or I'm a, a free man and you're a, you're a bond servant, you're a slave. No, 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 that's not what we do. Therefore, we, we are one in Christ Jesus, and that gives, us, um, that gives us the ability then to really appreciate all of the differences and really celebrate those things that are worth celebrating in terms of uh, the difference between men and women, uh, cultures, our cultures, our ethnicities, our languages, our ex you know, experiences, unique experiences. We can really celebrate celebrate those in the right way. Let me let me let me also suggest real quickly that when our identity in Christ is the controlling truth in our identity, it also frees us to be able to see the idols of our particular culture, gender, whatever. Right. So today we have a phrase called identity politics. Have you heard that? No. No. Okay. Identity. Yeah. Look, just look it up this week or tonight or whatever, okay. what identity politics is, but it, it's basically, it's basically the idea that, that one's identity, maybe racial identity or a sexual identity should be the motivating factor in, in, in terms of how one advocates and lobbies within the political realm. It's trying to get certain equity and, and making that kind of the number one thing. And there's not, there's, not this, there's not necessarily anything bad about some of the general ideas there, but it, it is such a well-known, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a kind of popular phrase in certain circles that it, um, it is a reminder to us that as we think through these things, that we are able then to go back and look at the, the groups that we might belong to, like you see in Galatians chapter three. So me as a, as a white you know, man, an American from Welsh descent, uh, if I look at my life, um, is my, do I think about the world and do I think about justice and equity through that lens? Or do I first begin with myself as a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus? And then does that give me the ability to actually look 
into these other circles of, of, of groups I might belong to and, and then be able to look with the eyes of, of Christ and say, well, this is something worth celebrating, but this certainly isn't worth something that's worth celebrating. That this is something to be, this is something over here that needs to be decried, that needs to be uh, dealt with, that needs to be remedied. Um, people who don't have that identity in Christ, sometimes they're more eager to guard those things or believe those things because that's a tribal instinct that they have, right? Their tribe, their group, and they want to, they feel defensive when they are, uh, when somebody is maybe in a healthy way challenging something about that identity. So they're, 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 it might reveal the fact that they're, they are thinking more about their identity in terms of those, def those defining features rather than the controlling idea of Christ, who does, you know, give us that ability to do that. So here's an example, one that's this not really connected to any of us, but back in the 1800s, when the first missionaries, late 1700s, early 1800s, and throughout the 19th century, when missionaries were arriving in India, they were confronted with a practice called sati. Have you ever heard of sati? No. Sati was the idea that in that culture, that um, when a husband died, there was some expectation that uh, a, a woman who was an upright woman and a devoted wife, she would throw herself on the burning body of her husband and die with him. Oh. So, yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a terrible practice. And, um, and um, it was something that was decried by, the, by those missionaries who came in and said, this is not right. This has to stop. Well, then you have this tension, of course, between cultures. It was turned into an issue between cultures where people would say, well, this is, this is our Indian culture, and this, that's your British culture or your Western culture. When really it was an issue of just justice. It was just uh, about the value of a human life. And, and um, but it was for, for some of those those Indians, it was, it was, it, it, it was, it took that, it took them coming to faith in Christ for them to look back at their culture and say, you know what, I am an Indian and I can celebrate that, but I can also say that this cultural practice is wrong. It is not okay. And of course, every culture, every nation, every tribe, every people is tainted by sin. So there's always going to be sin at work in all of these expressions. The idea of our identity in Christ helps us to be able to have eyes to see that and have the courage and perspective to be able to call out those cultural idols. Does that make sense, you guys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. here's, here's another idea in terms of our, of our identity. Here's a final point. Uh, this is going back to a verse that we heard before, I think in the first week, Deuteronomy 10, 19. God says, love the sojourners, therefore, uh, love the sojourners, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. So Paul was in, I'm mean, sorry, Moses was, God was encouraging through Moses, the people to see these immigrants in their midst. To be able to identify with them because they were also immigrants resident aliens strangers in another foreign country and so this idea of being able to identify them was was huge now that same word if we used if we were looking at the greek old testament not the hebrew but the greek old testament we would find that word sojourners is the same word that peter later uses in first peter 2 11 when he's speaking to Christians and says, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. So we as Christians are sojourners as well. We are immigrants as well. In what sense are we immigrants? This world is not our world. 
It's not our ultimate world. Right. This world system is not our home, right? The planet Earth right, is what right. we're created for. It's, it's our father's world. But this world system that as it currently exists, this age, this generation, we don't belong to it. Our citizenship is in heaven. So we as sojourners in this strange land of this world system, we uh, we should be able then to identify with anyone even today who is an immigrant, um, including a, a, a you know, literal immigrant coming from another country to be able to say, hey, man, we understand what it's like because we feel the tensions as Christians in this society that is 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 um, is so post-Christian and in many ways becoming anti-Christian. Mm-hmm. We, we feel that and we feel that rub. And so we can understand somebody who comes into our country who feels that tension and that rub with how they understand the world, their own language, things like that, that we can identify with them in that way. The gospel enables us to do that. All right, so a new heart, a new motivation, a new anchor, a new identity. Let me give you a kind of a, a, a kind of a great summary verse of all that we've been talking about tonight in terms of the gospel. This is James chapter 2, 14 through 17. Just notice all the themes that we've been talking about. James 2, 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Do you hear those same themes? Yeah. Yeah. Is is James talking about salvation by faith and works? A salvation that, that works. A salvation that does, a faith that does work. Yeah. Right? He's not talking about salvation, being saved by faith and works. He's talking about being saved by a faith that works. Like he says in the very first verse, verse 14 of chapter 2, can that faith save him? Emphasis on the word that. Can that faith save him? So that means James assumes that there is, there is such a thing as saving faith. But he wants to distinguish what, what this saving faith is actually like. Right, we are saved by faith alone, but what is that faith that we are saved by? It's a faith that actually produces a care and concern for those who are in need, just like we've been talking about, right? And if it's not there, if that impulse of love, if we are not compelled or controlled by the love of Christ, James is saying that is a dead faith, right? It's not a faith that's going to save you. Believing something believing something changing yes your, your, per, your, right. your perspective there's a shift in how reality is act, actually so. exactly do you remember the parable you guys of uh, when Jesus told a parable about the one who had been forgiven like a, you know two million dollars and then he went out and would not forgive the, the guy who owed him, owed him like a thousand bucks right uh-huh. that's, that's exactly the same idea is that there's a disconnect between, you know, if he really genuinely had understood what he had received, he would have gone and done likewise, being softened, being changed by that kind of lavish and generous and just almost ridiculous kind of forgiveness. The same thing that we can say here is that saving faith in a Christ of sacrificial love, the, the Jesus of sacrificial love, the Jesus of the cross, who takes poor, needy sinners like us and makes us rich by his grace when we don't deserve that according to our sins, that that changes people, that does change us. And we, and we know that's not just a, a switch in the inside that flips, it's also the presence of the Holy Spirit 
who comes and dwells among us through faith and then produces fruit, fruit of the spirit in us, like to love and to show kindness to others and to give as we have been given to. So I just wanted you to see a passage in which these same themes were at work, these same gospel themes. Now, here's one last, I know I'm a few minutes over, but let me give you one last kind of application example. Uh, oh, oh, here's just a restatement of the point that I made earlier. Rather than an either or, God's people best do justice by both sharing the truth of the gospel and living in step with the truth of the gospel. So, and we'll, we're going to unpack that coming up too in the, in the next couple of weeks as well. But notice this application example. If you slash we learned about a young girl who had been trapped by sex traffickers, should we A, work to liberate her or B, help her find spiritual liberation in Christ? A. Well, What's that? A, then well, B. Yeah. A first, get her out of that situation. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any any other different? I heard A and then both as qual qualified both and then both. You said both. What do you say, Stephen? Yeah, I mean both. Well, yeah, like both, but first you should do A. Well, yeah, yeah, and and, and who knows? Yeah, who knows? I don't know about first doing A. I, you could actually first do B, and that might immensely help her to deal with her situation until the point where she can be liberated, right? Be because then what I'm saying is if you are not able to actually help liberate her, then right. by all means, you've got to give her Jesus because that's the hope that's going to help her get through, right? To have the Lord with her, to have spiritual strength in her situation. Yeah, but, but she's trapped in the house next to you. You're going to call the police. No, I, yes, I'm j we're talking in total hypotheticals okay. here. Right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm saying when, when you say we should first work to liberate her and then do the second, I'm just saying it's not always that simple. Right. It may flip flop. It may flip flop. And you may be in a foreign country where you meet her and she on the streets and she tells you her story. Well, what are you going to do? You, you want to share Christ with her, but you also want to say, hey, I want to try to do everything I can to help you get away from these guys. I want I want to help you to escape from, but you also want to say, you know, that I also want to tell you about a, a liberation that is far bigger and more glorious and it's forever than what I want to help, what I want to help you to be able to achieve by finding freedom from these sex traffickers. But the, yeah, of course the correct answer is both, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's both of these things. Uh, these are, these should not be at odds, but often they are in interesting ways. Um, let me ask this question. What are the dangers of neglecting either one of these? So what if we neglect the working to liberate her and just say, well, look, the work of the church is to save people's souls. You could find her body in the gutter. Okay. And she could, okay. Get, her life could be taken easily. Okay. What? Uh, I don't know. I think I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm thinking more of, along the terms of our um, away team with Valerie and all those girls who are um, being rescued. Right. The, I don't, I don't think anyone, I mean, I don't know, but I don't think anyone is talking to her about the gospel until she gets to the safe place. That's why yeah. I say it's first A, then B. Well, yeah, in that you're right. In that situation, you're absolutely right. I'm just saying we're talking hypotheticals here. It, it, it could be A first. It could be B first. The correct answer, though, is both. Right. right? Eventually. Both. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. If, it, if you had it, Christian, but if if you think of it in a lesser, not so extreme, if a person came to you and they were starving and they had no food, and you had food, but instead you chose to to share the gospel with them and send them away with no food. Mm. What are they going to think about how that gospel was represented in their life? Very good. 
Very good. Right. It's like people who, instead of leaving a, a, a month, who leave, leaving money for a hardworking waiter or waitress, they leave a gospel track by itself. Right. I, I think that's a, a very terrible witness to do something like it's that. Not a good tip. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's the same point that you're not respecting the fact that they're trying to earn income. They're trying to earn something. You can talk. You can help them with put bread on their table, and also at the same time talk to them about the bread of life, Jesus Christ. And those those things work beautifully together, don't they? Right. So there, but there certainly are Christians who feel like. Well, let me, okay, let me, let me flip it around. Let me flip it around. What if we go the other extreme and say, well, the church needs to be the main, the main work of the church, all of our blood, sweat, and tears need to be in accomplishing uh, the liberation of all of these sex, sex slaves and other slaves, human slavery around the world. If that, should that be, uh, all of our blood, sweat, and tears should go into that work of helping uh, liberate people who are being trafficked? No. No, why not? Well, for one reason, the, the fact that we have different away groups points it out. God gives each of us a mission and a, a, a calling to where we are to impact him in society. And for everybody, it's not in that area. And there's so many different areas that God needs to be impacted for that we have to be attuned to the area that he's calling us to. Okay, good, good. But I'm, I'm thinking a little bit more, I'm thinking a little bit more um, conceptually in terms of is the work of the church to end trafficking of human beings? Is that the primary work of the church? No, no, no. It's not, it's not. It's the work of the gospel, right? Right, it's to share the gospel. Right. It doesn't, that doesn't mean that those things can't go hand in hand, but we have certainly seen in the history of the church where well-intentioned Christians who began to help the poor, the needy, the drunks, the, 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 the enslaved, the, the mistreated, uh, whoever it might be, ended up making that the primary work of the church because they felt like, well, look, we're making a real impact. We're changing people's lives on a daily basis because we're giving people, you know, food and clothing and we're seeing all of these things and people are thanking us for that. And, and then they began to, be, there began this kind of social movement among, in the church where, where the church began to lose uh, the truth about Christ, Christ who, who died for sinners. And it became, Christ became morphed into uh, the social revolutionary or it was Christ who didn't die on the cross to pay for our sins. He died on the cross as an example of love, and we should just have that same uh, that same desire to love other people out of the out of their social injustices. Therefore, that's what the work of the church is all about. So, the the social gospel movement is a great one to study if you're interested in that. The turn of the 19th to 20th century, um, the mainline churches today kind of have their roots in the social gospel. A lot of their very liberal theology has come from that kind of shift. Uh, and we see it We see it other places. World Vision is a good example of that. Um, I used to, I used to, we used to support, Anita and I used to support children through World Vision, but we eventually began, began to understand that World Vision was not preaching the gospel in many of the places where they were, they, they, where they were at because it enabled them to have more access if they didn't preach the gospel to certain places and they were kind of soft, soft selling the gospel. And um, that's why we moved over to compassion because gospel, compassion was much more gospel centered. They weren't just interested in doing the charitable works. As good as those were, we know ultimately as people who think about eternity, we know that all of these things are ultimately band-aids when it comes to one's eternal condition. Right. You could you can rescue a girl from sex traffickers, which is a which is a wonderful, beautiful, necessary thing to right that injustice. But if we are not concerned about her spiritual condition, that she's a slave to sin apart from Christ, then we do not dishonor God. And we are not a people who are thinking, have our mindset on eternity. 
and she will one day pay for her sins apart from Christ. Mm. So th these are the things we have to hold on to both mm. of these things without letting go of one or the other, that we are a people who, who work uh, in bringing the gospel. And uh, uh, along with that, we're also people of justice who are working to bless people physically, economically, socially, uh, all sorts of ways. That goes hand in hand with our gospel witness, but uh, it begins with the preaching of the gospel at all times, as Paul said. There were places, uh, if you think for, of Jesus, for example, there were places that Jesus would go and, uh, or even Paul would go and Peter would go where they would both proclaim the gospel and heal the sick, cast out demons, do those kinds of things where they were caring for people's physical needs, uh, emotional needs, social needs. Mm -hmm. But there were also places where they went and they just simply proclaimed the message and then they moved on. Now, in both of those cases, the common fact, the common factor is that they preached the gospel because ultimately the works that they did alongside of the gospel were, were meant, even though they were wonderful in and of themselves, they were ultimately meant to glorify the gospel and point others to the gospel. Uh, at the book of Acts describes the good, the miracles that the apostles, that Paul and Barnabas were doing. It describes them as bearing witness to the message that these guys were proclaiming. And we want to be the same kind of people. We want to be people who do justice in the world, ultimately not just to be charitable, not just to be people who care about justice because it's a worthy cause. That's true, but we want to be ultimately people who do so in order to point others back to God, the just God, the God of mercy, the God of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me give you one more point here. Some questions. Just some questions to think about, and I'll send you the PowerPoint sooner than I did last time. <laughs> Does the importance of gospel centeredness mean only doing justice with Christian groups and other believers? If not, what questions or issues need to be considered? So that's something just to think about. There are many good groups out there that are not Christians that are doing important things in our society and around the world in terms of justice how do we do we do we partner with them do we get involved with them if they're if they're not christians what questions or issues do we need to think about in working together alongside of them here's another question to think about in what ways might i be looking for earthly activism or involvement to do what only the gospel can do so there are many today who are, are activists and involved politically or socially or whatever in organizations, groups, whatever it might be, movements, causes, who are looking for a kind of salvation on this earth, a utopian kind of vision. Um, not saying everybody thinks that way, but when people don't know Christ, they like we talked about, believe in the good of human beings. They believe that if they can just correct all these things, we'll create our own utopia on earth. Um, we as Christians don't want to dismiss the causes and the efforts that are just, but we also don't want to be naive about <laughs> the human heart. Um, and so we want to be really sensitive and aware of that. One last question in light of this discussion, what factors might be hindering me in terms of generous and rich justice? So that's a question to ask. Yourself. That's a question to ask yourself. What factors in light of our discussion tonight might be hindering me in terms of generous and rich justice? Here's the homework. Read first Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. First Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. You're going to recognize some of these verses. I know it, but see if you can figure out what exactly was happening in the Corinthian church. What is the issue Paul is addressing there and how, how does it relate to our, see if you can figure out how it relates to our theme of do justice. Sound good? Yep. Yep. All right.
Great discussion, you guys. And please send me questions if you've got them this week. Um, and Or bring them next week at the beginning. We'll, we'll try to tackle them. All right, let me say a quick prayer.